Morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody here today. Um, it is that time of year again where we uh, do take up for the uh, Annie Armstrong offering, and uh, as we've done in the past few years, I just felt we've been more effective in our giving uh, uh, where we take up the whole month. And so uh, it's not about me asking you to pray whether God wants you to give to this offering. It's about me asking you to pray about how much God wants you to give to this offering. And, uh, and as the video just made clear, I hope it made clear, is that this offering uh, directly impacts North America missions. This isn't, this isn't a world mission offering, and it's not even just for the state. It's North America missions. And so every time we give to this, we are helping to support uh, get the gospel to, to uh, people who do not yet know Christ here in North America. And so uh, if you need incentive to, at, about why you need to give, there's just some incentive, though you shouldn't even need that. And so anyway, so just pray as the Lord would have you to give. Uh, envelopes are on the table in the back. If you haven't given yet, uh, we'll be taking up for this offering uh, all month long. So anyway. Uh, now we got that out of the way, let's get to our, our passage this morning. It is Palm Sunday, right? as many of you are aware on the, the, the church calendar. Uh, we've, we've already passed up Palm Sunday. Uh, we, we passed up Palm Sunday about a month and a half ago, I guess it is. And so we're already into Passion Week. Uh, we've been in uh, day three for a while, and <laughs> we're probably going to be in day three for a while longer. And so I don't, I don't want us to miss out on the significance of this day. I don't want us to, to just, just, just quickly rush by and, and forget the significance of this day. Now, was it like literally like this exact day? Absolutely not. We don't, we don't know when exactly it was, but we know what happened on this day. We, what, we celebrate that, that Christ completed his, or began to complete his mission, that he was entering into Jerusalem uh, to fulfill the, the purpose of his life. Uh, to head towards the cross where he would atone for the sins of the world. And we're so thankful for what this day represents. We're, we're thankful for what this week represents. But what we're, what we're really thankful for is what we're going to celebrate next Sunday right. on Resurrection Sunday. And so uh, and invite folks. Uh, you know, sometimes people don't come to church very often, uh, but quite often people will come on Easter mm -hmm. and on Christmas. And so let's be bringers. Let's invite people that that... that may not uh, normally come or would come, but they will come on Easter. And so let's ask people to come, and they'll hear the gospel um, almost well, probably every week. Hopefully every week you hear the gospel here in some way, shape, or form in a Sunday school hour or the, 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 the preaching. Uh, um, but next week you definitely will. Be very intentional about the gospel because that's what Easter is all about. Mm -hmm. It's about the gospel. So, But for today, we're going to talk about something that we don't like to talk about very much. Taxes, right? Taxes. And you say, why would you do that? Because that's where we're at in the text. That's what God's Word, where it brings us to this day. So open your Bibles once again to Mark chapter 12. Uh, as we begin to, a little series within the series, a little three-part mini-series. Uh, and the, the first one is just dealing with uh, taxes, the testing of Jesus, right? The religious leaders were beginning to, to be a little more methodical about their approach and, and, and how they were trying going to try to trap Jesus. And so uh, we're going to see this in three parts, right? I, I, could have, I could have did one really big, long sermon with, the, with these three sections, but I said, I don't think you would like that. I wouldn't like to have to preach that. And so we're going to do it in three different parts. This morning, we're going to look at the, at the issue of paying taxes from verses 13 to 17. And I believe this is a, a timely message, if you will, because there, does everybody in here know what happens on the 18th, the, the, the day after Easter? Can you imagine? How, what, a, what poor timing. Tax day, right? Yay, tax day. And hopefully many of you have already uh, taken care of that. And if you haven't, then you, now you know that the 18th is, is looming. So we have the, the great Christian holiday, the greatest day in the history of humanity, or, or at least one of, right? There's two, Christmas and Easter. And then we have tax day. What a drop off, right? What a, what a bummer to come right after we celebrate the resurrection. Uh, I'm pretty confident, as I've already said, that nobody in the history of the world has ever liked paying taxes, right? If I were asked for a show of hands this morning, and how many of you enjoy paying taxes and wish you could pay more? Nobody would raise their hand, right? Nobody likes to pay taxes. And, and however we may feel about paying taxes, guess what? They're necessary. 
for the type of society that we live in, they are necessary, right? Local, state, and federal uh, uh, agencies need to be able to have the resources to provide the services that we need, right? Taxes are what pay for our military, for our police, and for our firefighters and the EMTs. Taxes are what pay for public education, the public education system for staff and, and facilities. Taxes are what pay for building and maintaining our infrastructure and roads and bridges. And I know what you're thinking. <laughs> well, I'm going to deal with that later. Some misallocation of abuses. We're going to talk about that and say, well, you know, we're doing that. It's supposed to be for the roads. Our roads are pretty poor. You're right. No, they, can, they can use but, but that's what they're given to. That's, that's one of the reasons that we give taxes. And taxes also pay for the countless programs that help feed, clothe, and house the most vulnerable among us. And I can go on and on. Now, are there times when we are being overtaxed? Yeah. Amen? Amen? Overtaxed. Yes, absolutely. Are, are there people that take advantage of the programs that our taxes pay for? Again, we would say, amen. We know this. Are there times when tax funds are being wasted and misused? Again, yes, right? Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. And even though those things happen, taxes are still necessary for the type of society that we are part of. It's true today, and it was true 2,000 years ago. It's unpopular and contentious today, and guess what? It was unpopular and contentious in the time of Jesus as well. That's why I believe the religious leaders use this matter of paying taxes uh, to test Jesus in hopes that how he answered would turn the people against him. Turn the people against him, or if he answered in another way, he'd be able, they would be able to turn him in to the Romans and say, look, we have an insurrectionist. We have someone stirring up the people and telling them not to pay taxes to Caesar. And so either way, that was their plan. That was their thinking that they could trap Jesus and turn the people or the Romans onto him. In our text, Jesus had just exposed them as the enemies of God through a parable that he had given, right? That they understood the parable. They knew that he was preaching against them and so did everyone that heard them. And then we, we know that the, the, the passage ended with them just saying basically that they, they had left him and went away. Apparently what they did when they went away is they went away and, and plotted and schemed and planned and said and, and circled the wagons about how could how could we get this guy? We, there's got to be a way. We're we're smart. We're we're the, the leaders of society. There's got to be some way that we can come up with to catch this guy and, and, and kind of turn the people against him. And that's what they did. They they come up with this scheme to to, to, to trap Jesus and and this topic of taxation was the, the perfect thing, that, or so they thought, because everyone hates taxes, right? Everyone hates taxes, and the religious leaders hated Jesus. See, this was perfect. This was a perfect plan for them. This was the perfect way for them to get rid of Jesus once and for all, or at least that's what they thought. You see, nobody was going to lay a hand on Jesus until it was time. Right? No one was going to lay a hand on Jesus till it was time for him to go to the cross. And guess what? The time was getting very, very close. That Jesus' date with the cross was just a few days away. And so let's take a look at this first test. So grab your Bibles now and stand if you're able as we honor the reading of God's Word together. Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 17. Mark writes, Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God and truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. And so they brought it. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. This is God's word. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you have given us. We thank you for what this day represents to us as your sons and your daughters as we are mindful 
of this being uh, the Palm Sunday, the, the day that, that Jesus uh, first entered into Jerusalem to begin his journey to the cross. And so, Father, we, uh, we are so grateful that you love us. We, we're so thankful that you love us so much that you gave your one and only Son to atone for our sins, to make a way for us to be forgiven, to make a way for us to be reconciled back to you. And so, God, we thank you for this week and what it represents. And, Father, we look forward to next Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of your Son. But, Father, for now, we have to deal with a text, a difficult text, a, 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 a troubling text to, to some in this room, Father. And I pray that, that we'd understand better from your Word our role as, as your people and, and, and taxation and the purpose of taxes. But more than that, that we'd understand uh, your plan and your purpose for government and society and authority and all these things, Father. And so let us not get bogged down in the single issue of taxes this morning. But God, you have a plan and a purpose for all things, that you are a God of order and not chaos. And Father, I also pray this morning as we look at this text as we're reminded of Jesus and we hear the good news again that Father if there be any amongst us today that have not yet placed their faith in Jesus have not turned from their sins God I pray that this would be that day that salvation would come to this place we love you and we ask these things in Jesus name amen you may be seated The first thing that we see in the text this morning is the deception. The deception. Uh, then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God and truth. <laughs> this is, it's almost laughable, right? That, that we, we, we've been following along in the text, and as we are familiar with uh, Jesus' relationship with the religious leaders, and we, we hear someone say this, we, we can't help but kind of laugh to ourselves, because we know what's going on. We all know, we all have experienced it ourselves. Have you ever, have you ever had someone come to you and kind of uh, just say overly polite things about you? They may be true, but they're just out of character for them. You, can, can you tell when someone's trying to butter you up? Right? They're really laying it on thick, and they're just, it's just Jesus knew what was happening here, right? They, 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 these, are, these are the same ones that, that uh, have, have fought against him and tried to disparage him and discredit him all along these, these last three years, and now all of a sudden they're just, man, you're just awesome, Jesus. You're the best teacher ever. You're great, right? You're, you're, everything about you is true, and you teach the truth. You're awesome. And then they spring these questions, Right? It's kind of like that with your kids, right? They're, they're being all sweet and nice and maybe they've done some extra chores and then they come walking up. You know they want something, right? <laughs> they want something. They want some money. They want you to buy something. They want to go to a movie. They want something. And so that's kind of what's happening here. After the chief priests and the scribes and the elders had retreated, after their last encounter with Jesus, they had plotted and they had schemed to how they could turn the people against Jesus and they decided to send a coalition, an unlikely coalition of the Pharisees and the Herodians. Like, uh, th this is strange. I'm going I'm to tell you why here in a second. Most, you may not realize this, but th these two groups of people don't typically hang out together. They don't have much in common. They don't care for one another. Uh, per perhaps they would you know, be able to deceive and therefore disarm Jesus with their flattery, but we know that this simply doesn't work. They spoke to him respectfully. They called him teacher as a recognition of his authority. Uh, oddly enough, everything that they said about him was accurate and true, right? There was nothing that they said that was, that was wrong about Jesus. They said that he was true, meaning that he only spoke what was true. That's a fact. They said that he was impartial in his dealings with all people, meaning that he never changed the truth of God's word to cater or coddle to his listeners. He never pulled any punches, right? Truth is truth, right? So that's actually a fact. You see, because God's truth is God's truth. It does not change because God does not change. That's right. And Jesus is God, right? Jesus is God. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
And what they were doing here is they, they were admitting that he was nothing like them at all, in a sense, right? Because they had been exposed as enemies of God. They had been exposed again and again as hypocrites, as saying one thing and doing another. And, and, and you, can, you can say lots of things about Jesus, but you couldn't say that about him. He was no hypocrite. He was a straight shooter. He spoke the truth. No matter how you respond to whether it hurts your feelings or not, it was true. And that's what they were saying here. They spoke the truth about Jesus, but they were insincere in their words. That's the issue here. They were insincere in what they were saying about Jesus. That might work on most people, but Jesus wasn't like most people, right? Some, sometimes we get suckered into this, that maybe, maybe we're just having a low day or, or having a bad week and someone does speak kindly to us and they have ulterior motives behind it, but we don't. We don't catch on because we're so starved for attention that we get suckered in. We don't even realize what's happening until it's too late, until the trap has been sprung. But you see, that's not what happens to Jesus. Jesus doesn't get tricked like this. Jesus wasn't like any other person that had ever lived before. I mean, how can you deceive someone that cannot be deceived? Right? It's, it's, it's not possible. How can you deceive someone that literally knows everything? Because that describes Jesus. It kind of it kind of makes me think of I, I, I read these texts and we, we think about the religious leaders and how they they how they were hardened against Jesus and how how deceived they were. But they but but they they literally because they chose to not believe who he was. Their their understanding was so darkened that they they literally did not understand who he was. If they understood that or, or that, that that he was in fact the Son of God, how can they even? come up with some plan like this to think that you're going to trick Jesus, that you're going to trick God. How could you possibly even think that? Yet here they are. The devil had tried this same tactic with Jesus after his baptism in the wilderness. If the devil couldn't do this, if the devil himself could not deceive Jesus, these Pharisees and Herodians didn't have a shot at deceiving him either. What this is is nothing but theater. You know what I mean by that? It's just theater. It's just putting on a show. That's all that's happening here. They were merely pretending to respect Jesus. And not only that, they were pretending to respect one another. Showing up together and as a coalition, as a, as a joint, a united front against Jesus. If this was any other day, the Pharisees and Herodians would not even speak to one another. Much less agree to work together. This would be the equivalence of the Republicans and Democrats working together. Right? How, how often does that happen? It's, it's rare. And then when they do work together, when they do come together and say, hey, we, 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 we were, there's a, a bipartisan agreement that both sides are together on this. Whenever we hear that as the American people, we should be concerned. That's right. Because when they agree on anything, usually it's not for our good. And that's what's happening here. Right? The Pharisees, Pharisees were the pure bloods of Judaism, and the Herodians were half breeds. and Roman sympathizers, they, they weren't friendly towards one another, to, to say the least. The Herodians were allowed to rule as puppet kings under the authority of the Romans, and, and they ruled with their own interest in mind and the interest of Rome, and therefore the Jews despised them. They could not stand the Herodians. And Jesus posed a tremendous threat to both groups, and therefore it would be mutually beneficial to both groups to get rid of Jesus once and for all. Therefore, they combine their efforts together to work together to get rid of Jesus. That Mark tells us that they hope to catch Jesus in his words, to trap him in his words. Now, Pastor R.C. Sproul gave some really good insight on what was being said here in this text. He said this, he said, The word catch is a rather feeble and insipid translation of the Greek that is used here. The word is agrua. This word is a, a, a hapax legomenon. You ever heard that word before? It's hard, it's hard to say. A word that appears in the New Testament only once. That rarity means it is difficult to grasp the full measure of the meaning of this word. The verb Mark uses here means to take by honey. And it has connotations of violent pursuit. The idea is something like hunting for a man-eating tiger by digging a pit and putting sharp spikes at the bottom so the tiger will fall in and be impaled. The Pharisees and Herodians were not just trying to play tag with Jesus. 
They were trying to destroy him with violence. That's what's happening here. This is a perfect example of the saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right? That's what we see happening in this text. You see, we must be careful that we're not guilty of trying to manipulate Jesus too because we can do that as well. Did you know that? Right. We can do the same things if we're not careful. Do we sometimes use true but insincere words about Jesus when we pray? Right? That we just, we'll just use all these phrases and oh, you're so great and you're so awesome and you're so wonderful. There's no God like you. Right? I, I trust you in my whole heart and on and on I go. Just all these flattering words and then and, and, in our, our heart of hearts, we don't mean anything we're saying. We're just trying to get Jesus to do what we want. Mm -hmm. right? We're trying to butter him up to kind of get him on our side. And so he will answer our prayers the way that we want him to. We can be guilty of doing the same thing. If we do this, we're the ones that are being deceived because that's not how Jesus answers our prayers. Mm -hmm. He's not going to answer your prayers because we flatter him. Because we say nice things about him. True, but nice. But that, that's not how things work. You see... Jesus always answers our prayers one way, according to God's will. It's always according to God's will. We're not, we're not going to convince or manipulate Jesus to answer our prayers if they're not according to God's will. If we really want to see Jesus give us what we ask when we pray, we must ask in our prayers according to God's will. That's what we see in 1 John 5, 14-15. It says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. You see, Jesus saw right through all of this. He saw right through the flattering words of the Pharisees and the Herodians, and Jesus sees right through our flattering words too. Why? Because he cannot be deceived. He cannot be deceived. The second thing that we see in the text is the dilemma. The dilemma. Picking up in verse 14 says, The question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. And so they brought it. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. They believed they had placed Jesus in the same kind of dilemma that he had done to them when he had asked them about the baptism of John. Right? When he, when he asked them about the baptism of John, is it from man or is it from heaven? Right? And, and remember, they, they consult amongst themselves and they, they knew they were the ones trapped in. You know, that if we answer this way, then we're doomed. We answer this way, we're doomed. And so what did they decide to answer? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right? How many times do you get that? Right? Uh -huh. what's, you know, what's, the, what's the answer here? But that's the same thing. The same type of a scenario that uh, they were doing here. They chose to play dumb and simply say that they did not know where John's baptism came from. They were hoping to put Jesus in that same type of a no-win scenario with the people. They honestly thought that they had finally trapped Jesus. But guess what? Wrong again. And so, so here's the dilemma I believe that they believe they created for Jesus. If Jesus answered and said that it was in fact lawful to pay tax to Caesar, the people would turn on him. That's what they hoped, right? So that'd be bad for Jesus and good for the religious leaders. But if Jesus answered and said to the people they should not pay taxes to Caesar, they could report what he had said to the Romans and have them charged with insurrection. Right? He'd be done away with. Once again, that would be bad for Jesus and good for the religious leaders in this text. He would be popular with the people for saying that, but that wouldn't matter anymore because he would either be dead or in prison. Right? And so that's what they were hoping would happen here in this situation. This would have been a serious dilemma for anyone else, but guess what? Jesus isn't like anyone else. Jesus is the Son of God. Right? That's right. Jesus is the Son of God. Nobody is ever going to be clever enough to trap Jesus in his words. This was not going to work. It didn't work before, and guess what? It's not going to work this time. That Jesus knew what was in their hearts. He knew their hypocr hypocrisy. He knows all things. 
Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 kind of speaks to this, 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 this vast understanding that God has. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, it's just, it just boggles my mind that they thought that they could be more clever, or just they could, they could trap Jesus and, and trick him into to doing what they wanted. They thought they were the ones testing Jesus, but Jesus was the one testing them. As Jesus always does, he turns things around. He told them to bring him a denarius to make his case before them. They would make it clear that they were the ones with a dilemma, not him. They were the ones that were being put on trial here, not him. A denarius was a small silver coin that carried the value of a, a day's wage, right? Now, think about that. That's, that can be quite pricey depending on what your, your work is. Uh, just imagine in this room here, imagine if you had just one single coin that was equivalent to your day's wages, right? And so you understand, just compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. It was pricey. It was a, this was a very valuable coin in that day. And that's what he was talking about. Bring me one of these, these coins. That every year the Jews were required to give a day's wages to the Romans as a tax in addition to the many other taxes that were placed on them on a regular basis. And so it wasn't an issue so much about paying taxes. right? They understood that paying taxes was just part of the deal. Uh, even in the church, the same thing. And in Judaism and even in Christianity, uh, tithing is a, in a way a, a form of taxation, right? Same thing. It's a, it's a necessary thing to, to support the, the, the mission and the function of the church in, in a similar way. So they understood that. They, that wasn't where the beef was. That wasn't the heartburn so much. It wasn't just that the people hated paying taxes. They hated paying taxes to the Romans, right? To the Romans, to the, the occupying forces. That, that's where the real heartburn was. James Brooks explained it this way in his commentary on his past. He says the tax was hated not because of its amount, but because it was a symbol of foreign domination and because it had to be paid with a coin that bore an image of the emperor and an offensive inscription. That's really what this was about. That's really was where, where the beef was. That paying taxes isn't just about money. Paying taxes is about authority. That's really what it comes down to, right? That, that for even us in this room, that, that's part of it. That, that's, it's not really about paying the taxes. It's a, we don't like being under anyone's authority. That's the issue. Every time the people paid their taxes to the Romans, it reminded them that they were under the authority of the Romans. And they absolutely hated that. They hated that. They despised that notion. But don't miss out on the fact that Jesus didn't have a denarius in his possession, right? Don't, don't just read right over that, right? We know, sometimes we think about Jesus and he can just has all these things and we, you know, that he, he, but he says, I, I don't have, I'm basically a homeless man, right? He, he didn't have one of these coins. He didn't have a, a day's wage in his pocket, but there's, but there's more to it than that. He asked them to produce one and they had no problem producing one from among themselves. I believe Jesus was very intentional with the words that he used in his question. You see, Jesus is always intentional. Every word that he speaks, there's a reason behind it. Every word that he uses. And so, whose image and inscription is this, was the question. Whether they realized it or not, they were walking around with graven images in their pockets. Mm. <laughs> Imagine that. Pharisees, right? The experts in the law, the religious leaders, the ones who would... Uh, just rail against idolatry and all the, thought, the pagan worship of, of Rome, and yet here they are packing around these coins in their pockets that has these graven images. They were continually breaking the second commandment. One side of the coin had an image of Tiberius Caesar, the emperor at that time, and on the other side, on, on that same side of the coin, it had an inscription that said, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. Think about our coins that they have the, the head of a president that says, in God we trust. That's, the, that's how I kind of imagine this, a similar inscription below that. And so we have this blasphemy on these coins. And on the other side of the coin, it didn't get any better. The other side of the coin said, high priest. <laughs> so you understand, it's a, the, the irony here of them packing these coins around and, and they're using this as a, as a trap to, to use against Jesus and he turns it around on them. You see, the emperor wasn't just the ruler over the, 
the Roman Empire, he was to be seen as a god, to be treated as deity. And so now he turns things around. So now, now who, who has the dilemma? Not Jesus. They're the ones who have a dilemma. The Pharisees had to be nervous when they answered that the image and inscription were Caesar's. They knew that they had failed once again by then. The Pharisees pride themselves on their righteousness and their strict obedience to the Ten Commandments as well as hundreds of other additional religious laws. They intended to make Jesus look bad to the people and guilty before the Romans, right? That was their plans, but Jesus turned things around. Instead, Jesus made them look bad to the people and guilty before God. Something far more severe, more, more, much more worse. To pay or not to pay taxes to the Romans wasn't the real dilemma. To believe or not believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior was the real dilemma. That was the real dilemma that they were under. The Pharisees believed that they had a right standing with God because they had kept all of his commandments perfectly. But again, they were wrong. It's not possible. There's no way that he even just, he just proved it once again by this, having this coin in their possession. Nobody can keep God's commandments perfectly. That's why we all need Jesus. Right. That's why Easter matters. That's right. right? That's why we're celebrating Easter. That's why we recognize today as Palm Sunday that, that, that God did something for us that we were not able to do for ourselves. We celebrate the resurrection. Nobody can keep God's commandments perfectly. Romans 3.23 says that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. All, without exception, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That Jesus lived the sinless life that we couldn't live. He kept the commandments perfectly for us. And so here's the really good news about what we're seeing here. The good news. When we return from our sins and place our faith in Jesus, his perfect righteousness becomes our righteousness. Amen. Right? When God looks upon us, he doesn't see our sin anymore. He doesn't see our our disobedience anymore, all he sees is the righteousness of his son when he looks upon us. We have a right standing with God because of what Christ has done for us. Jesus is the only way that we can have a right standing with God. Did you know that? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. He's the only way that we can have a right standing with God. He didn't say, well, I'm a, I'm a good person. I'm not as bad as my neighbor. I'm not as bad as my coworker. We're always pointing to someone else trying to, to say we're better than here, here, here's the, here's the, the, the bar. Here's the, 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 the measuring stick, if you will. How do you stand up next to Jesus? Because that's, that, that's the comparison, right? That's right. Are you as good as him? Are you as perfect as he is? The answer is no. And if you're not, then you don't meet the standard. That's right. Again, that's why we need Jesus. And he's the only way for us to have a right standing with God. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, there's not multiple ways. That's right. There are not many ways. There's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. You see, some of you have the same dilemma this morning that the Pharisees and the Herodians had. Your greatest dilemma is not deciding whether you need to pay taxes or not. It may be a dilemma. Some of you may be trying to decide whether you're going to pay your taxes or not, or maybe you're going to try to find a way where you can get out of paying your taxes or whatever that might be. But that's not your, that's a problem, but it's not your biggest problem. You see, your greatest problem, your biggest dilemma is deciding whether you need to believe in Jesus or not. Amen. That's your dilemma this morning. Whether you need to believe in Jesus or not, don't, don't make the same mistake that the Pharisees and Herodians did. Don't make that same mistake. Believe in Jesus today while you still can. The third and final thing that we see in the text is the directive. The directive, verse 17, says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Once again, their plot to catch Jesus' words backfired on them. Then Jesus answered, uh, answered in, in one of the ways they hoped he would. When he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, he was telling the people to pay their taxes. Pay, pay your taxes is what Jesus was saying. This wasn't a suggestion. This was a directive. This was a command. 
Right? Because we know that God does not make suggestions. Jesus does not make suggestions. He said, pay your taxes. And why would he do that? It's a good question. Jesus, I believe, was affirming what the Pharisees should have already known to be true. If you look back into the Old Testament, just a few different books of the Old Testament, we look in the book of Daniel. In Daniel 2.21, we're told that God is the one that removes and raises up kings. He's the one who does this. In Daniel 4.17, we're told that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and that he is the one that gives the authority to rule to whomever he will. You see, Daniel was serving under King Nebuchadnezzar during the reign of the Babylonians, right? A pagan nation. And God is the one who had raised them up. Another clear example of God establishing kings and kingdoms is in Isaiah 45 regarding Cyrus, the king of the Persian Empire, the one who defeated the Babylonians. Isaiah 45, 1 through 7 says this, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name and the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I, from the, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. So here's the point that Jesus was making, I believe. If God is the one that establishes kings and kingdoms, God's people have an obligation to submit to and support those kings and kingdoms in ways that do not promote sin and disobedience. In ways that do not promote sin and disobedience. That we are to submit to our governing authorities up to the point where they're telling us to do something contrary to God's word. Right? That's what, that's what God's word tells us. Now, are all kings and kingdoms godly? No. Are all emperors and empires godly? No. Are, are all presidents and nations godly? Absolutely not. We're living through it right now. Right? right? We, we can walk out these doors and we, we, we're experiencing that that's not true. And yet God is the one that has established every kingdom, every empire, in every nation throughout the history of humanity. God is the one. Did you know that? Right. He is the one. That's what God's word says. He is the one who has established every one of these kingdoms, empires, and nations. That he is the one that has given kings, emperors, and presidents the authority and responsibility to rule over, care for, and to protect his image bearers. He is the one who has done all these things. The Roman Empire didn't surprise God. And neither did the wickedness and brutality of its many emperors. You see, God had a plan and a purpose for everything that he allowed to come to pass. Everything. That God is the one that raised them up and God was the one that would remove them too. Right. Yes, the Apostle Paul suffered greatly at the hands of the Romans. And he was eventually put to death by the Romans. Right, Lost his head after spending time in a dungeon. Right, Not, not house arrest. The end of his life was, was horrible. Right? Literally a dungeon. Chains, mud, muck, raw sewage. Right? You get the point? Cold. All these things. And at the end of his life, he was taken out and lost his head by an executioner's axe. The Romans. But God knew this. God knew all this. Even as he was witnessing and experiencing the injustices and persecutions of the Roman Empire, Paul understood that their authority came from God. He understood this. He understood their authority came from God. He told the believers in Rome to do the same thing that Jesus told the Jews to do here in our passage. We see this in Romans 13, 1 through 7, a passage that's become quite popular over this last two years. It says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. 
Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will, be, will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is, a, he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because, for because of this you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Verse 7, I think, is the key to this whole thing. Render, therefore, to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to which whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Amen. You see, so this is, this is all throughout God's Word. We see these principles, these same truths. Jesus' first directive was for the people to pay their taxes, to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And that likely turned many people against him. As soon as he said that, they was already beginning to turn against him. The Pharisees and the Herodians were right when they said that Jesus did not regard the person of men and that he taught the way of God in truth. He didn't, he didn't backpedal. Right? He almost like doubled down. He didn't change things so that people wouldn't get mad. He spoke the truth. The second directive was even more important than the first one, I would say. Jesus told the people to render to God the things that are God's. Render the things that are God, the things that are God's. What did Jesus mean by, by this one? This is the, 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 the logic, I believe, of what Jesus was using. It caused the people to marvel, is what we see here, what Mark said. If the denarius had Caesar's image on it, that meant that it rightly belonged to Caesar. The people were to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, right? It's all again about image, right? That's the one of the key words here, image, right? And so what belongs to God? It's easy for us to say, and we wouldn't be wrong in saying it, everything. Everything belongs to God. But there's something in particular here that Jesus wanted the people to understand. In Genesis 1, 27, we're told that God created man in his own what? Image. Image, right? Imago Dei, image, in God's image image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. We bear the image of God on us and therefore we rightly belong to God. We rightly belong to God. Or Ken Hughes makes the connection this way. He said the coin was Caesar's because it bore his image. We are God's because we bear his image. We bear his image. So let me just ask you this morning, have you given yourself to God, right? right? Have you done that? Have you given yourself to God? Have you turned from your sins and placed your faith in His Son, Jesus Christ? If you haven't, let me encourage you to do this today. Do it today. If you have, are you still giving yourself to God each day? Because it's a continual thing. Did you realize that? Even when we're talking about believe the gospel, believe in Jesus, it's not just a one-time belief, it's a continuation to keep on believing. You know, as we give ourselves to God, we don't just give ourselves to God once, we continue. We continue to give ourselves to God day after day, over and over and over again. We're to do what we see written in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Where Paul writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, we are to continue to give ourselves to God. It's not just a once and done thing. We continue to live our lives as living sacrifices to God. We give our whole lives to Him day by day. So this morning as we wrap things up from this text, kind of thinking about what we've seen here and what we've heard from this text this morning, the Pharisees and the Rodians thought they were the ones <coughs> testing Jesus, but in reality, Jesus was testing them. He was testing them and he was testing the people that had gathered to, to see the next debate. 
That's what we see in the text. But for us, what about you? What about me? What to my brothers and sisters in Christ this morning, every time we open God's word, every time we attend Sunday school, every time we attend discipleship training, every time God's word is being preached, guess what? We are being tested. That's right. We are being tested by God. Are we going to be hearers of God's word or are we going to be doers of God's word? See, it's always a test. It's not, it's not just enough for us to sit here and shake our heads in agreement and take pages of notes. It's to do what we've been told to do. Right. Hear God's word, apply God's word. It's a test. So how do we do that? How do we render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God? How do we do that? Simply put, we pay our taxes. We pay our taxes. No more than we need to, right? Unless you're just really feeling really generous. Pay your taxes. Pay your taxes like good citizens do and present your bodies as living sacrifices to God to be used for his plans, to be used for his purposes, and ultimately used for his glory. That's how we do this. That's how we apply this text. To those that have not yet rendered to God the things that are God's, would you be willing to do that this morning? Right, have, have you, for those of you that are here this morning that have not yet given yourself to God, that for those of you who have not yet turned from your sins and placed your faith in Jesus, would you do that this morning? That's how you give what belongs to God. The things that are God's, give them to Him. Give yourself to God this morning through placing your faith in Jesus. Let me pray for us and we'll have a time for us to respond as God leads. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've made. We thank you for your beautiful word that was given to us. We are thankful for your beautiful son of whom we gather this morning to worship. Father, we thank you for the truthfulness of your son. We're, we're thankful for the truthfulness of your word. God, I pray that you would help us to apply your word to our lives today. As your people, as your sons, as your daughters, God, that yes, you want us to be informed by your word because we can't do what your word says unless we know what it says. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to understand your word, but more than that, help us to do it. Help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. So, Father, help us to be good citizens. Help us to, to, to pay our taxes. Help us to, 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 to promote unity and not disunity. Father, so help us to be everything that you want us to be. But more than that, God, I pray you help us to, to give ourselves to you day by day. Not that we've just given ourselves to you in a saving way, but, Father, that we would submit ourselves to you on a minute-by-minute on a minute basis, continually giving ourselves over to you for your plans and your purposes and ultimately for your glory, whatever that might be, whatever that might take, whatever that might cost. And so, Father, we give ourselves to you this morning. Father, I pray that uh, for those that might be gathered here with us this morning that have not yet given themselves to you, that have not yet repented, have not yet placed their faith in Jesus, God, I pray that that would happen this morning that this will be a day of salvation for many. And God, for those that would do that today, Father, help them to understand the, the truth of the resurrection. And, and Easter would take on a whole new meaning to them from this day forward. God, thank you again for the, the blessing of gathering with your church this morning around your word. And thank you for the leadership of your spirit. God, now we trust you at this closing time of invitation that we would respond in a way that's beneficial to us and glorifying to you. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.